It is now eight o'clock, so we're going to get started. Good evening, everybody. My name is John Winkowski. I am the planetarium coordinator at the Besser Museum Planetarium. That's the museum down in Alpena, Michigan, for those of you that are unaware. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about um, Earth's relative motions. So let me get this started. Uh, no, that didn't work. Let's, man, I'm so used to just pressing F5. There we go. I guess it was just a little bit delayed. All right. So we're going to be talking about Earth's relative motions. And this is just the different motions that our planet makes throughout the day, year, eons, and kind of what they're related to. I'll be talking about these different forms of motion, um, a few facts about them. And at the end, if there's time, we'll just sort of do a Q&A segment for any lingering questions that people may have about this topic or really anything astronomy related. So let's start by talking about what is relative motion. So uh, relative motion itself is just basically all motion. Whenever we're measuring anything's movement, we're always relating it to something else. Uh, the best example of this in my mind is driving a car down a highway. Like you're going 60 miles per hour. That means every single hour you're traveling 60 miles over the surface of the earth. You're not going 60 miles per hour in relation to the moon or your cousin Ted over there. You're going 60 miles per hour on earth. And that is what your relative motion is, is your motion in relation to the Earth. And in physics and in astronomy, anytime we're actually talking about something's velocity or motion, this is what we always have to ask is, what is it moving in relation to? And us here on planet Earth, well, there's a lot of motions that are happening right now. However, because we're traveling with this giant rock spaceship called Earth, we don't tend to notice them. So what exactly are these motions? There's six of them that I want to discuss today. These are the ones that really jumped out at me as being the most important. Uh, so we're going to start with some of the smaller, easier ones that most people probably already know about and understand, and move up to the really big ones that most people probably don't think about on a daily basis like at all. Let's get going with rotational motion. Rotational motion is the obvious one. Our planet spinning each and every day, right? And in fact, that's what causes the days our planet is rotating around in relation to the sun. And when one side faces the sun, it's daylight there. And when it's facing away, it's night time on that side. This motion is really, really simple. Um, even flat earthers tend to understand that the Earth is rotating in some respect, and it's caused by this ancient fact from when the planet itself formed. So like four and a half, five billion years ago when Earth formed, um, all this rock and dust and other debris was sort of floating around our early form of a star. And over time, it coalesced together into this giant planet Earth-sized rock. While it was doing that, it was pushing itself closer and closer and closer uh, together, compacting itself more and more. And this compaction caused it to begin to rotate quicker and faster. You've probably seen this problem before in a physics classroom to where the teacher talks about figure skaters. Essentially, they're spinning around, you know, doing their pirouette, and when they wrap their arms around themselves, sort of bring them in, they start to rotate faster. And the same exact principle is just scaled up to a literal planet size. So our planet just continues to spin billions of years after it formed. Has of course slowed down a bit, but that's not a discussion we're really going to get into today. Next motion is going to be orbital motion. Orbital motion is pretty simple. Our planet rotates around the sun, and as it does, 
one full rotation, we call it a year here on planet Earth. Now, like I said, the sun is what causes this rotation, um, but it's mostly due to the sun's gravity because while it may be 93 million miles away, it's still like a thousand times the size of planet Earth while being like much, much heavier than that. So its gravitational pull is constantly trying to suck the Earth in towards it and kind of like just pull it towards the center mass of the sun. Now what stops us from becoming a fiery inferno is that the Earth is also kind of moving perpendicular to the sun at the same exact time. So instead of just heading straight to the sun and becoming a fireball, we end up having this nice circular orbit and we get these cool years each and every time that the Earth goes around once. Now our orbit, while being kind of circular, isn't actually a circle. That is to say, it's not perfectly round. It's a bit elongated. And there's actually times when Earth is closer or further away to the sun. And there's a common misconception that this distance is actually what causes the seasons, but that's not true. We'll get to that with our next point of motion. Just understand for now that the Earth can move uh, away and towards the sun at different parts in its orbit. And that also lines up with the whole not flat part I have up here on the screen. The fact that we're not only getting kind of closer and farther away, but also kind of going up and down at the same time in relation to the celestial plane. And speaking of the celestial plane, our next form of motion is, well, related to that. And that is our tilting or our rocking, which is the actual cause of the seasons. So you can see over here with this cool nifty video I have that throughout the year, we end up having like the day night cycle change a bit. In fact, just last week here in the Northern hemisphere, we had the summer solstice. It was the longest day of the year and it was just, the day that we got the most sunlight. And this is all caused by that rocking motion of the Earth itself. Throughout the year, it's tilting 23 and a half degrees towards and away from the sun in relation to the celestial plane. Now, the celestial plane is simply the equator of the sun, just imaginarily spread out throughout the entire solar system in order to uh, sort of give us a level sort of middle ground for where our solar system is at. Uh, it's, like I said, an imaginary line, just kind of like our actual equator. It just helps us kind of understand where things are in this giant 3D box that is outer space. This actual motion itself is pretty cool, and it's uh, another leftover remnant from when Earth formed but it's, uh, it happened a little bit after the planet itself came together when a giant planet-sized object called Theia, or uh, Orpheus, I believe it's called sometime, slammed into the size of this ancient Earth. This object was about the size of Mars, and when it collided with Earth, the current theory is that they essentially obliterated each other and what was Earth and they uh, turned into like this giant spherical gooey ball of magma just kind of floating through space. Over time, that magma ball kind of pulled it onto itself, turning into a ball and then cooled. And now we kind of have Earth a few billion years later. Uh, the thought process is that this collision was so intense that that gooey sort of magma ball actually was uh, tilted uh, towards the sun in that one direction and then kind of moves back and forth due to some very weird astrophysics, spinning physics stuff that I honestly don't want to get into. But essentially, this ancient collision caused the Earth to tilt. It's still tilting to this day. And because of that tilt, hey, we have seasons, which is pretty cool. 
I don't think I'd want to live in like pure summer or like pure winter all year long. And a side note that uh, Theia Orpheus collision is also what's theorized to have created the moon. Essentially, this giant Mars sized planet hit the Earth and ejected enough debris around uh, Earth into its orbit, which eventually cooled down and turned into our current moon. Not really related to this, but it's just kind of a neat little fact, and I figured we might as well talk about it while we're discussing Theia. All right, moving on to a bit of the weirder motions right now when we get into precession. Now, precession is one of those motions that you're not going to directly observe with your own two eyes within your lifetime. And that's because this slight wobble motion takes place over a very, very long time. Like we're talking like tens of thousands of years for the Earth to complete one full precession, that circular movement that we can see on the right side of the screen right now. Now this motion is just a product of the Earth spinning. Uh, if we go back to like the Earth actually being uh, formed, it starts to rotate around. And while it's rotating, it's also slightly wobbling. Um, you can always think of it like a top. Whenever you spin a top, it's not gonna sit in one exact position and perfectly rotate around constantly. It's gonna slightly wobble and kilter until that wobble eventually takes over and it runs out of energy, rolls off the table, and you eventually have to get down on your knees and hunt for it, right? I guess that's just me. Anyways, uh, this same process is happening with Earth, except we don't have to worry about it running out of energy because in outer space, there's nothing really tugging on the Earth's wobble. So it just continues to sort of wobble and go around in this big processing circle. Now, this precession is first thing on our list that's not really related to the sun, because the precession is mostly in relation to the background stars, like those very distant stars, many trillions upon trillions of miles away, and our Earth ends up pointing to different ones in different ways. And the best example of this is with our pole star. Like right now, we have the North Star. Polaris, right? You go out tonight, you look for the Big Dipper, follow it to the Little Dipper, hey look, there's Polaris, our North Star. However, that's only possible right now because our North Pole is pointed out in the space almost exactly where Polaris is located. If we go back in time, like 4,000 years to when the pyramids are being built, Polaris wouldn't be in the same exact part of the sky. And I think actually the North Star back then was Vega. However, don't quote me on that exactly because there's like a bunch of different stars that'll end up being and have been our North Star all throughout history. And this is gonna change as well in the future. As Earth continues to process, it's gonna point into different places in outer space. And in another like 2,000 years, it'll no longer be the North Star Polaris. It'll be the North Star like Aldebaran or something else like that. I honestly have to look at a star chart. I don't remember what star it'll be off the top of my head. But if you're interested, there's a list online, just Wikipedia, like future pole stars or procession, and you'll get a nice list of what they'll be in the future. In case, you know, you're time traveling, that'll be important to you. Next movement is uh, one of the big ones, galactic movement. So our planet is orbiting the sun and that sun is just one small speck of light and this giant disc that we call the Milky Way. Um, Milky Way is our galaxy, has about 250 billion different stars in it. Uh, I think that's the latest research on it um, back from 2019, about 250 billion stars, yeah. Anyways, almost all of these stars are flying around the edges of the galaxy, orbiting that sort of white hot center at the center of this galaxy. And that little white center is the active galactic nucleus. 
Essentially, it's this big, super massive black hole. Uh, this thing's like millions of times the mass and density of our sun and like many thousands of times bigger. I know some of these giant black holes get to be like the size of multiple solar systems, so pretty big. It's pulled in a lot of stars and other matter from the galaxy around it, so that's why it's glowing like really white and very brightly, is because there's a large uh, cluster of densely packed stars in that region of outer space. Now, pretty much everything in our galaxy is slowly rotating around that centerpiece. And for us, about halfway out from the middle of the galaxy, we're rotating at a rate of about 230 million years uh, per rotation. Just to kind of put that into a frame of reference, 230 million years ago here on Earth, the dinosaurs were just starting to form in the Triassic period. Uh, they weren't the big, bad king lizards that they would become. They were just like these tiny little lizards that were getting eaten by like super big dragonflies and other really big animals at the time. And 230 million years from now, well, who, who knows exactly. Suffice to say, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting to think about how much changes in that time. Now, the Earth and the Sun are rotating around this center part because, well, just like the Earth rotates around the Sun, the Sun's being sort of pulled on by the gravity of this central part of the galaxy. And the same goes with pretty much everything in the galaxy. Uh, the fun thing about galaxies, though, is that, like, the edge parts are actually spinning too fast for, like, normal matter to properly work. Uh, if you think about it like this, like, if you go on a merry-go-round when you were a kid, were you ever, like, hanging on to the very edge while your friends spun it as fast as they can to see how long you could hold on? It's kind of like that with the stars. Um, except they're literally spinning so fast that there's literally no way for them to exist where they are without some sort of like safety net or physical force to really hold them into place around the galaxy. And in our case, uh, and what we expect to be the case in pretty much every other galaxy, is that there is this uh, sort of field of dark matter that sort of envelops our galaxy. Now, dark matter itself is just this super dense, invisible form of matter that we know, like, next to nothing about because we can't directly observe it. You can ask me some questions about it, but I'm probably just going to tell you it's complicated and we don't fully understand yet. But this dark matter acts like the safety net that this outside stars need and keeps the galaxy rotating around the way that it does. And without it, well, galaxies as we know it probably wouldn't exist in our universe. Now, galaxies like our own have lots and lots of stars in it, but not all of them are moving at the same exact rates. Like our sun is kind of in a static pattern, constantly moving around the center of the galaxy, but there are like arms and bands inside the Milky Way, which swirl around at different velocities. And these stars end up like swirling past each other, but they don't really interact or collide, so to speak. Um, in fact, there's so much space between like all stars that the actual probability of any two stars physically interacting with each other is like so incredibly minute and tiny that it might as well be zero. Outside of like binary stars that form from the same gas cloud, um, that's a bit of a different story. Um, like just for reference, like our closest star, Alpha Centauri, is like four light years away, and that's approximately like 24 trillion miles. Um, and that's our closest one, so that should go to show you how much space is between each and every star, and why there aren't like star collisions on a daily basis, and why galaxies are even able to exist to have this many stars swirling around them. Now, our planet is once again swirling around this galaxy, but the galaxy itself isn't stationary in space. 
the galaxy itself is actually traveling as well. And we're going to reach the intergalactic movement of our actual uh, part of the show. Um, essentially, intergalactic travel is just the part where our galaxy is moving towards something called the Great Attractor. Uh, great Attractor, I couldn't tell you exactly where it is in outer space off the top of my head, um, but even if I could, it wouldn't really make sense because it'd be like, yeah, the Milky Way galaxy is moving uh, towards this direction of space and it'll reach like this one place millions of light years away and like trillion amount of years. It's just too much time and distance to really make sense in our head anyways. But if you're really interested, again, you can always go fact check and look things up online after this. Now our intergalactic travel is pretty incredible to think about. And that's what this picture is sort of representing is the full scale of like our entire universe. Um, these little threads, these filaments, as we tend to call them, are a collection of many, many galaxies. Each and every point of light that you're seeing at this point is either like a super giant galaxy or like some sort of giant galaxy cluster. That means that each light at this point is representing like tens, if not hundreds of trillions of stars. It's incredible. And uh, those great attractor that I talked about earlier, one thing that you can see pretty clearly is like this really bright spot towards the center of like our web. That would be a similar great attractor and it is just a more densely packed region of galaxies and dark matter that has enough gravitational pull to continue pulling on other galaxies and galaxy clusters. And that's what this movement is in relation to, in all honesty. It's all moving towards these giant, super dense galaxy clusters somewhere really, really far away in outer space. Uh, it's kind of frightening to think about at times. Uh, it's a relatively new area of study as well, so there's plenty to still think about and study and learn from this. It's kind of cool in the long scale sort of perspective of it. Now our different forms of movement from today, we started really small with just the rotation of this tiny little grain of sand that we call Earth, and we moved all the way up to the intergalactic movement. Those uh, motions of galaxies and galaxy clusters throughout the vastness of the entire universal web. Uh, when we think about it like this, again, it's kind of funny to think about how tiny and insignificant everything is on our planet in comparison to that giant intergalactic movement and how we can kind of see a little bit of it with each and every step as we sort of move up with these different motions. Okay. So that's pretty much the end of my actual presentation right now. If anybody has any questions at this time, feel free to ask. Let me just get to the last page if I can. All right. So I'll open up the floor. I had a question. Just to see what your opinion was. Sure. So you talked about, you touched on dark matter a little bit. I was wondering what your thoughts were um, as far as being, do you think we have gravity wrong or do you think huh. wimps are still a possibility or like what exactly is your opinion on what dark matter is at this point? So the idea that dark matter is WIMPs, uh, for everybody that doesn't understand, WIMPs are weakly interacting massive particles. And the theory was that dark matter is just this like normal particle uh, that's like just a version of like a proton or some other particle that we know of that's just a lot bigger and more massive 
but it also doesn't really interact with anything. So that's where the weakly interacting massive particle comes from. As far as that concept goes, I don't think it has a lot of credibility anymore after some of the experiments that were done to test on dark matter. One of the main ones that comes to mind is they had this super dense tank of like liquid xenon and like an underground gold mine. And the whole concept was that if dark matter existed as a wimp, it would at some point collide with the liquid xenon and we'd be able to observe that reaction. However, despite what we uh, identified as a likely candidate for the WIMPs, and never at any point did we see that liquid xenon interaction, even after increasing the density and the size to try and just reach out and get something. As far as gravity goes, there's definitely a lot about gravity that we could still learn about. I personally like the idea of there being a graviton particle. However, there's still a lot of research to be done on that. Uh, gravity itself is just a very confusing and fascinating concept. And whether it leads to the origin of dark matter and what it is still remains to be seen. Honestly, it's just a very confusing substance and we're just having a really difficult time trying to study it right now. Well, I know that WIMPs were part of, I mean, you got to believe in string theory and that's 100% theoretical because those were basically super symmetric particles. There's, you know, a particle just like this, only it's heavier and that was where the WIMP candidates came up. There's also like neutrino theory that is there enough neutrinos in the universe to make up that extra mass because they're really hard to detect. And I was just, I was just kind of theory curious what you thought about. So I appreciate that. Thank you. It was a very good question. So one thing I kind of wanted to talk about but didn't get to in time is that uh, with the movement of like intergalactic bodies, the whole frame of reference thing is kind of hard to understand when we're talking about a scale that large. Like I was saying that it's moving in relation to like these super galaxy clusters, but when you start to think about it like really, really deeply, it's like, is it actually moving in relation to these galaxy clusters or like the entire like medium of space time itself due to just the weird type of physics that tend to come up when we are dealing with objects this big and this massive. Um, it's pretty complicated, but it's also kind of fun to think about like actual space time being the medium for which these objects are traveling. It's all about reference. That it is. It's the most basic part of physics. Uh, if anybody ever looks to take physics courses, one of the first things they'll teach you is, hey, what are we measuring against? And that's part of what brought this whole conversation up tonight. So if nobody else has any questions, um, I guess I can stay here for a little bit and just see if anybody else pops in. Because we are technically going to 10 p.m. tonight, right, Sydney? Uh, so feel free to linger and see if anybody else comes in to ask questions. I might do part of the presentation again if someone shows up really late. Uh, I guess we'll just I'll wait and see for now. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I appreciate everybody taking the time to join this discussion. If you want to see more stuff from me or the museum, you can always check out our YouTube channel. We got some cool stuff there. Thanks. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, thank you. You're most welcome. So when when yes. does the museum, is it normally open for people to come into it? So the museum itself is open again. We have a bit of a different system. We have like tour times throughout the day to where essentially from like time X to like time Y, we're only taking like 25 people. And after that time, we kind of shoot people out. That way we can clean the museum and then we open it back up afterwards so people can come and go again.
As far as the planetarium goes, I'll be opening up on the 8th of next month. Just uh, waiting on some projector lamps. That way we can get everything running up to like peak ability for our guests. We'll probably come see you. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, that'd be really cool. I didn't know it actually existed until today. We're actually from the, the Flint area. Oh, cool. And we always go home to the Dark Sky Park. I had found it several years back, and we've been going ever since, and I've gotten him hooked on it. And um, so thank you. I was excited to actually get to, to do this with all the, you know, everything going on to have something. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's nice to be able to interact with people again. It feels like it's been like 20 years since I last had a live <laughs> audience. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so it's really cool to have people interested in this type of thing. So, and so I don't know a whole lot about physics. I know just like the bare minimum, but I do love like just watching the stars and that. And so I know there's a meteor shower coming up in, in July. What are your thoughts on, I guess, that and, like, the um, like the best viewing or anything? Any tips, sure. I guess? Or yeah, so you know? summer is great for meteor showers. Like, throughout the summer season, I think we have, like, three or four decent to, like, just slightly above low level meteor showers. And, like any meteor shower, the best place to view it is always someplace dark. Those fireballs, they're not always the brightest because sometimes you just get like little teeny tiny particles that are burning up and the slightest bit of light pollution may ruin your view of it. So going someplace like, you know, the Headlands Dark Sky Park is a good place to watch the meteors. If you want to see peak activity, um, prepare to stock up in like a bunch of coffee because they usually are very, very late. Um, We're third shift nurses. We got this. Yeah. So you're third shift nurses, so you're already up at that time. Uh, so the best bet right. is to just do a little bit of research on the meter shower. Uh, just see when peak time is, and then make sure you're at a dark location at that time. So I got a question from the comments. Are there any advances in technology slash experiments that are expected to help speed up learning or gain further insight that we are hoping for? So that's a good question. Are there any experiments or technologies? Um, with astronomy, one of our biggest technologies is obviously telescopes, right? We need those tools to be able to look out into outer space and record all of those stars in as high quality as we can get. And on that grounds, there is a very large telescope being built in Chile right now. Um, there's actually this educator slash astronomy program before the whole pandemic called ASEP, where you could go out and visit it at like the top of this mountain peak and see them building like this. I think it's like 40 or 50 meters wide. In diameter, it's it's huge. It's going to be like the biggest telescope on the surface of the Earth when it's completed. Oh. Yeah, it's going to be like doing an entire scan of the sky like every few days, like just pretty much deep scanning the entire sky like every few days. Um, and that'll help us out a lot. Um, that's on the surface. One space-borne telescope, you might have heard of it, is the James Webb space telescope that is in production. It's been in production for a long time and it's expected to be the replacement uh, or at least the sort of predecessor, a predecessor, but like the ancestor of the Hubble telescope. It's a work of art, honestly, and it is meant to help us just observe a lot more different things a lot more effectively. Uh, essentially like take a Hubble telescope and make it like 10 times as technologically advanced and you have the James Webb. It's going to be an amazing piece of technology when it's complete and I hope that they're finally able to finish it. But it's been a lot of delays lately so it's still on the surface being worked on right now. 
let's see, as far as experiments go, I can't think of any experiments off the top of my head in physics. Um, well, one thing is, now that I think of it, is the Large Hadron Collider is actually undergoing some renovations at the moment as well, or at least coming close to being done, so that they can do bigger, more different collisions with their particle accelerator. And that'll hopefully help us understand more about the world of particle physics, which can hopefully tell us more about like antimatter, dark matter, gravity, or many of the other other mysteries that make up our universe. That's all I can think of off the top of my head right now. Um, yeah, hopefully that's a good enough list of a few different things that are happening in the world of astronomy at the moment for you. Oh, there we go. We got one. So what resources would you recommend for someone who is interested in astronomy slash astrophysics but has a very limited background in physics? So as far as learning physics goes, there's plenty of very easy introductory courses online that you can take through colleges now. Um, especially with the pandemic, a lot of colleges are offering free online courses. And you could do like a introduction or a physics 101 class. If that's a bit too tough for your time schedule, there's always like YouTube series such as Crash Course Physics, which will talk about some of the basics. As far as astronomy goes, um, one of the best tools I can think of is downloading an app on your smartphone that can view the night sky like a planetarium does. The one I personally use is Stellarium. It's like Stellar, except I-U-M, kind of like at the end. And it allows you to just take your phone out, point it at the sky, and it'll identify like every single object in the sky. It's a very useful tool, costs like $3 for a one-time purchase, and you have like this supercomputer that can calculate like everything in the sky at the palm of your hand. If you want to keep getting into astronomy, you're of course going to eventually need a telescope. But as far as what to start with really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, plenty of guides out there as well to kind of tell you what you're looking for and what type of telescope you need. So that's some good places to start if you're trying to get more into astronomy and physics and astrophysics. So let's see. Next we have what are your thoughts on all the new satellites that were sent up and the interference with astronomy? Also, I cannot unmute again. That's really strange. Can I do something that muted everybody? Mute headset? Ha. Huh. Okay. Well, let's see. I'll ask you to unmute. We can go from there. So the question, once again, was the satellites recently launched. Uh, for those of you that don't know what this person is talking about. They're asking about the uh, Starlink satellites launched by Elon Musk's SpaceX program. This uh, Starlink system is supposed to bring like internet all around the world via this linking of like hundreds, if not thousands, of different tiny satellites. But the problem that was coming up with astronomers is that these satellites were actually causing interference with our astronomy by literally flying right in front of our telescopes and our cameras, messing up like long exposure photographs. Yeah. So if you've ever seen a long exposure of like the night sky, you notice it's like uh, little circles 
like as all the stars kind of like look like they're rotating around the North Pole. And with Starlink, they were just sort of acting like these big lines, just like getting right in the way of what we were observing. And this can be very damaging because there's some objects that we need very, very long exposures for that can take little years of exposures to properly get the data that we need. Uh, wow. As far as fixing it, I know that uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX have been talking with astronomers and astrophysicists to try and fix the issue. I know there's been a discussion of like tilting the satellites so that they're no longer as reflective to the surface, but we'll just have to wait and see how it works out because we can't be having our entire field of science ruined just so that more people can get internet, I believe. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, Yeah, it's a it's a cool project. Don't get me wrong. I'm legitimately excited at the idea of everybody on Earth, regardless of where they're at, having access to the internet. But some mistakes were obviously made, and now we have to deal with this issue of these satellites. Which, on a side note, if you've ever actually seen them, like when they're launching up to like their orbit, it looks really really cool. Like it looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. You just see like this long chain of like lights, uh, like these small satellites, just like traveling in synchronization across the sky. It's kind of eerie, but it's just so, so cool. I'd really recommend looking it up online after this, or even right now, just because it's such a really weird phenomenon. Yeah, I know. I brought that question up about them because, what was it, back in, was it April? There was a meteor shower. We were... The Lyrids. Yeah, the Lyrids. And we were watching it, and I kept a count of how many, you know, stars and different things we saw. And so way more satellites than we did, you know, anything else. And, and then he had told me what happened, and I couldn't believe that. It's just really interesting. So thank you. You're welcome. So another just little bit on that, uh, before Starlink was started, there was about 5,000 satellites in orbit around Earth. That includes active and inactive, like all the way back from like the days of the space race. And with the current proposal of Starlink, I think that number would go up to like 20,000 although there's been talks of bringing it like even higher depending on the current success of the Starlink. So we're going to triple, if not quadruple, the amount of satellites before this whole thing is over. So random fact that I just thought of when we're talking about satellites, um, the International Space Station, it's uh, probably heard of it, biggest satellite about the size of a football field. It rotates around the Earth uh, about 250 miles above the surface, so not too far away. And a cool fact about that is if you go to the most remote region uh, away from land on Earth, Point Nemo in like the South Pacific Ocean, when the ISS passes above you in orbit, it'll be the closest human being to you. It was really cool that you did this, especially with the, the movement, because one of the nights we were watching, I kept thought, thinking that my eyes were playing a trick on me, or I thought, I was like, oh, it's a UFO, because there was a star I was watching, and you could actually see it move. Because mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming it was, you know, maybe the gravitational pull of 
the other stores around it or you know in relation to the the, the movements that you did, you know we're just talking about so it was nice to hear you explain it because it made me think of that like oh okay so you know that it was what i was actually seeing is was you yeah. know the motion you can see some of the motion I kept thinking I was going crazy. <laughs> yeah I, I bet there is a natural phenomenon to where the atmosphere uh, actually kind of like makes the object sort of dance and move around just due to the shivering of how the light moves through the atmosphere. But there is a process known as like gravitational lensing. Um, you wouldn't have likely seen that with your own two eyes though. That's a pretty unique process where like super dense amounts of gravity causes like actual space time itself to warp and then like light from behind it can like come around the other side um i think it was first proven during like a solar eclipse by einstein like he proposed this theory and people were watching the solar eclipse to do the study for him and they saw stars behind the sun uh literally on the other side of the sun due to that gravitational lensing. So that is something that can actually happen in real life. Yeah, there's a experiment going on right now that I forget which satellite telescope looks for those, but it looks for the um, gravitational rings to look for evidence of dark matter. So when there will be nothing that you can see that's causing the gravitational lensing, but you can see that effect because there's a galaxy behind it being distorted and actually forms that halo. Um, they're looking for that so they can map out the, the, the dark matter. And I, I forget what the satellite or the mission's called, but that's active right now. Oh, that's really cool. I think I've heard about that. It sounds familiar, uh, looking for dark matter halo super gravitational lensing. It'd be awesome if they find it, but my guess is they'll probably just find like more black holes first before they see dark matter. That's something else that bugs me is black holes too, is that we work on degenerate pressures to get to white holes and then how much mass does it take before you hit that threshold before it collapses on a neutron star. And then uh -huh. there's black holes, but they say collapse into infinity. It's only because we can't see beyond the event horizon to see what's going on. And I've, I've been stuck on that to see if there's some other type of degenerate pressure that keeps it from collapsing on itself, which um, you know, it's been rolling saying. around in my head, like to keep it to get from, because one of the theories is like a Planck star does, is, is a Planck length the smallest possible unit that something can collapse to and what would be the, you know, the, the de degenerate pressure, what could be the resistance to keep it from, because honestly, there's, infinity is a nice word to say that we don't know what's going on, but to get quantum physics and, and, and relativity, Relativity to agree, you know, that's all you would need to solve that problem. And there's degenerate pressures that keep certain things in check. It just seems like that's like the last frontier. We just can't see beyond that dark event horizon to see what's going on in the heart of a black hole. Uh, so that's an interesting idea. So for those of you who don't know, degenerate pressure uh, is involved with super dense, uh, like, star artifacts like neutron stars or white dwarfs which are remnants from when a star was alive they can like blow up in supernova and like all the stuff that was a star gets like hyper densely compact down into like these neutron stars or white dwarf stars and the degeneracy pressure is like the actual uh, like atomic scale of like the neutrons or the electrons that are physically resisting further collapse downwards. So if you think about it like this, electrons, neutrons, protons all like take up space and they like exert force upon other subatomic particles. And at some point, what would like happen if you like keep pushing on that force? Uh, because it has a natural limit. And the concept of black holes is like you have neutrons, which are thought to be like the densest uh, subatomic particle at this point. And if you push past their barrier, past neutron stars, you get a black hole. And the hypothesis that was discussed is, is there another 
object out there, another like subatomic particle or elsewise that could possibly resist even further. Um, the idea was, well, we can't actually observe past the event horizon in a black hole because it like goes into quote unquote infinity, which pretty much means that we can't directly observe the light because all the light that goes in gets sucked in and never comes out. But there is a way that we can study that by actually looking at the subatomic particles that we are aware of in nature. So we may not be able to like directly look into a black hole, but we can test with other particles that we are able to observe. So like besides neutrons and electrons, we could look at like maybe uh, a neutrino degeneracy pressure just to throw a random subatomic particle out there that some people may have heard of. And we could mathematically test what their ability to resist this compression is and see whether or not it would be possible to actually go beyond that with uh, after the neutrons give away. And right now, our current understanding of black holes is that there's no particle, no force in nature that can resist beyond the neutron uh, that we know of. There may be like some weird hypersubstance that we'll think of in the future and discover, but as of right now, there's nothing that we can possibly note that we've discovered and know of that will mathematically work out to resist such high amounts of energy in such a small amount of space.
I'm going to stop recording and end it then.